Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on appeals and post-trial practice. For those of you joining us for the first time today, my name is Tashia Rasul. I'm a partner here with Lois Law Firm. I oversee the construction practice defense group here at Lois. Um, today, we're going to talk about appeals and other post-trial tactics related to appeals. Um, we'll talk about when should we appeal a decision, the effect of the stay in awards, tactical reasons to appeal, cost of an appeal, and practical advice and takeaways in the end of the at the end of the webinar. Now remember, this is a live webinar. You can ask questions uh, during the course of the webinar, and I will provide an answer at the end. This is what the dialog box looks like. Just click on that, type in your questions, and I'll see them at the end. Um, before we get into it, I do have to talk about our 2020 handbooks. As you know, we're always busy here at Lois, keeping up with the law, putting together our handbooks um, to offer practical advice to our clients. Uh, Greg has been uh, updating the New York and New Jersey handbooks for many years now. And new this year, we have a construction handbook authored by yours truly. Um, we decided to uh, craft a, a construction handbook because of the complex issues and the very nuanced um, issues that are uh, prevalent in construction workers' compensation claims. It's focused on New York workers' compensation and also the general liability component. If you haven't heard of this construction handbook yet, please email me and I will send you a copy. If you need one of the general New York and New Jersey ones, also send me an email and we'll get a copy right to you. All right, so in concert with how busy we are, we now have something going on every single Monday of the month, something to keep you busy after your weekend. The first Monday of every month, we have the construction uh, webinar series hosted by me. Uh, the second Monday, we have Risk Transfer Webinar Series hosted by Christopher Major. He is the head of the Civil Department here at uh, Lois that focuses on like risk, tra risk transfer and subrogation issues as they relate to workers' compensation. And um, the third Monday, we have the General New York Webinar. And the fourth Monday, we have New Jersey for those of you interested in learning about New Jersey also. So you can go on the website, sign up for the webinars. Um, the New York and New Jersey, it's usually at 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. The construction and risk transfer, it's usually 12 p.m. on the Monday it's scheduled for. All right, so let's talk about appeals and where the case law come from. Oftentimes, you'll hear your attorneys talking about, well, the case law says this, the case law says that. Or you'll have a client who's asking you, well, what exactly does the case law say about this particular issue? Now, where do the where do the case laws come from? They come from the uh, decisions from appeals. So one of the purposes of appeals is to create case law, to change case law. Um, looking at the hierarchy of decisions, the Court of Appeals, this would be the law of the land in New York. Whatever the Court of Appeals says goes. Then below the Court of Appeals, we have the Appellate Division um, for Workers' Compensation Claim, the Third Department. Appellate Division oversees workers' compensation claims. Most of the case law is from the Appellate Division because when they make a decision, parties usually don't take it to the Court of Appeals unless it's a really complex or a nuanced issue that they want the Court of Appeals to address. But most of our case law, I would say, come from the third department. And then on the administrative level, the workers' compensation level, uh, the board panel decisions are the ones that create law and the very minor number of uh, full board panel decisions. All right, so this is really just an overview of appeals in New York, uh, in New York workers' compensation. After a law judge makes a decision, we can, within 30 days of the filing of the notice of decision, appeal to the board panel. The board panel consists of three judges, who are going to review the entire record, review the arguments presented. 
and make a decision on whether the underlying decision should be affirmed or uh, rescinded or um, modified. Next, if we're still not happy with the board panel decision or we think the board still made a blatant error in applying the facts or law, we can then file an application for full board review and or an application to the appellate division. And I'll talk about, about why it's and or in a minute. And if we're still not happy with that decision, then we can take it up to the Court of Appeals, which is something that's rarely done, but it's done enough so that new case law is made at that level. All right, so what exactly can be appealed to the board panel? Oops. <laughs> Any final decision by the law judge or the board. So the EC23s, the EC23R, um, those can all be appealed to the board panel. In order to file an appeal, you must use a form called RB89, the RB-89. If this is not filed, the board is not even going to entertain your appeal. So it must be filed. It must be completed. All of the boxes must be checked off. The basis of the appeal must be listed in there. The record that's being um, relied upon should be listed in there. It has to be signed and it has to be served in all parties of interest. And it's done within, it has to be done within 30 days of the filing date of the notice of decision. So this is important because the actual notice of decision is issued a couple of days after the hearing date. So um, coming out of the hearing, you might already be thinking that you need to file an appeal 30 days from that day, you might have a day or two extra. So just be sure to look at the actual um, filing date of the notice of decision or the reserve decision to calculate your actual deadline for filing the appeal. A note on the RB89 also, it's um, the board is really strict about the completeness of the RB89. So it's very, very important that everything is filled out. The board has been bouncing back the appeals based on them. And the appellate division is saying that the board is right to do so. All right, so the next level, a lot of times we file the appeal with the board panel and then they come back still not properly analyzing the facts or the laws. And they're like, what, what is this nonsense of a decision? While there are still more options, we can take it up to the full board um, by filing an RB89.2. So like the board panel, the application for board panel review, um, a form must also be used, it's RB89.2. Again, it must be complete, it must be signed, all parties must be served with it. Um, when you file the application for full board review, you can also file a notice of appeal to the third department at the same time. You don't necessarily need to know at that moment whether you're going to file an appeal with the third department, but the thing to keep in mind is that the notice of appeal, placing everyone on notice that we intend to take it to the third department, must be filed within 30 days of the board panel decision. So best practice, best practice is when you're filing the application for full board review, file a notice of appeal at the same time. Um, we'll talk next about the cost and the complexity and the pros and cons of taking it to the next level. So if a decision is made to file it with the third department, you go ahead, you do that, you have six months to perfect the appeal if the decision that's being brought down by the third department is not what we were seeking and we still think there's been an error of law, we can then file an, app, uh, an appeal with the Court of Appeals. This is the highest court. It's also high cost and complexity, very similar to the costs associated with the third department appeals, which we're gonna go over shortly. All right, so, I know you can't see my face anymore, but I'm still here <laughs> as I go over this chart really quickly. So let's go through the different kinds of appeals um, and when, when is a stay effectuated, the cost, the concurrence, and the percentage wins. So the board panel, that's the first level. 
awards are stayed. Now, what exactly does this mean? So let's say, for example, a case is denied. We go to trial, we lose at the trial, it's established and awards are made. You, if, if you're filing an appeal of the establishment of the claim, you can withhold all of the awards that were made because your position is that the claim should not have been established in the first place. The cost of filing a board panel appeal, there is no filing fees associate, associated with it. It's just the amount of time, hours that your attorney and paralegal spends on it. And there is no concurrence appeal, meaning um, you have to wait until a decision comes down on the board panel from the board panel before going to the next level. 30% of the times we win at the board panel, this, it might seem to be like a low number, but it really isn't given how claimant friendly the system is. Um, a lot of times the judges at the hearings, if you've ever been to a workers' compensation hearing, they rush through, they're behind in their calendar, they don't take all of the facts into consideration, they don't take the law into consideration, so they're making really rash decisions. So about 30% of the times we have the board panel who are taking a more detailed, thorough look at the facts and overturning the decisions about 30% of the times. Now the next level, the full board, uh, there is no stay. So if the board panel comes back and says that the awards were properly entered, you have to immediately issue payments. Payments must be made within 10 days and it's being made with interest. If you're going to make an application for full board review, there is no stay of the awards. You must pay the awards and continue to pay them for the life of the claim unless they're suspended for some other reason. Again, there are no filing fees here and it's all based on the amount of hours your attorney and paralegal spends on it. Is it concurrent with another type of appeal? Yes, it is concurrent with the appeal to the third department um, through, through which you filed the notice of appeal. The full board, we see about a 10% um, prevailing rate at this level. The issue with the full board is if all of the board panel members concur, the full board review becomes discretionary. And in those cases, they review them like very, very few times. If one of the board panel judges actually um, give a dissenting opinion, meaning they're not all agreeing on the decision that's ultimately being made, then the full board review is mandatory and they have to review. In those cases, about 10% of the times we see that they're overturning or modifying the board panel's decision. Um, so concurrent to the full board would be the third department's appellate division appeal. Here, no awards are stayed. You must continue paying awards. And this is where it gets complex and it gets a little costly also. So the appellate division has very specific requirements in terms of like the length of the brief, the size of the brief, how the, the record must be submitted, how the brief must be submitted, which requires us to send it to a printing company that specializes in this kind of work. And that's where a lot of the costs re are really racked up. Plus the time that an attorney has been um, drafting the brief and the paralegal has been putting the documents together. Uh, this, this is concurrent with the full board because the process actually starts when you file the full board appeal. And statistically, we've seen about an 8% chance of prevailing at the appellate division. The Court of Appeals, the awards are not stayed. The cost is the same about the third department appeal. It's not concurrent. Um, not many cases go to the Court of Appeals, so we don't really have any solid statistics on uh, the, the prevailing rate, uh, very few, very, very few of them are taken to the Court of Appeals, either because we believe that the issue, um, it, it would not make a difference to take it to the Court of Appeal because the appellate division has provided like a substantive analysis, or the appellate division has given us the answer that we're looking for. Okay. So, that's our overview on the appeals. Um, just to keep in mind before we get into the question and answer, 
appeals are not only for creating case law or to get in that decision that we think should have been made, it can be used for tactical purposes also, which quite honestly, it's a reason we file appeals on many occasions. Um, as I indicated with appeals, benefits can be stayed. So that's one way to trigger settlement negotiations or move them along, even though we may not, um, we may not have a solid viable appeal as long as it's not frivolous and we're going to get a frivolous appeal penalty sometimes it's worthwhile to just file it to get the claimant to be interested in settlement and move in the case along that's perhaps the biggest um, tactical reason for filing an appeal so definitely keep that in mind it's not always about making case law or changing case law it could be just to move the case along sometimes you have those cases that are two and a half years old, three years old, and it's just not going anywhere, and no one's interested in settlement. But guess what? The moment the benefits are suspended, you might be interested in settlement, especially during the holidays. All right, so if you have any questions, type them in right now if you haven't already. I'm gonna take a look. Um, see if there's any questions. Okay, so I Okay, so I have I have two questions, two really good questions. All right. So, I have a question from Melissa D, and the question is, can we appeal the order of the chair decisions even though they say they cannot be appealed? I was told by a WCB examiner they can be appealed, but not sure how or if that is the case. Excellent question, Melissa. So the order, the orders of the chair are not subject to the uh, section 23 appeal, meaning you don't need an RB89. We've been successful in appealing the order of the chair by writing a letter to the board. You can accompany it with, um, you can send it with an RFA too, but you don't always have to. Uh, explain the reason why you're objecting to the order of the chair. So there's, it's technically an objection, not an appeal. Um, there is no timeline for it, but we do recommend that it's uh, that, that it be done within 30 days. We've never had an issue with that. The board usually reviews it, issues an amended one, or rescinds the decision based on whatever explanation that we're provided. I would just recommend that whenever you're objecting to it, though, you have a substantive argument in your letter um, referencing any documents in the board file um, so the board knows exactly, the examiners know exactly why you're objecting to it. Okay, my next question comes from Lee D. The question is, what reason does the WCB accept to exceed the number, the limited number of pages on an appeal? Okay, so it has to be a good reason or a sufficient reason. Um, We've been successful in submitting appeals that are beyond eight pages by showing that it's a really complex issue, that a number of different issues are being appealed, and that it actually takes an analysis of uh, many years of facts and case law to uh, present the arguments. That's, that's, how, that's how the board is going to accept an appeal that's more than eight pages. But I will tell you, they are very, it's very, very, very discretionary. We've seen cases where they do not accept it beyond eight pages, no matter how good of a reason we think it is. So whatever you do, I fully recommend keeping it to the eight pages. The argument can be made in eight pages. At least arguments good enough for the board. Keep in mind also the board believes that the arguments can be made by using just the RB89 with a box that's about three inches big. So um, your attorney should be able to compile all of the arguments into eight pages. Uh, what I usually do for brevity, instead of detailing the facts, if I feel like the facts are taking up a very long, um, a very big part of the brief, reference the record more often in as opposed to actually detailing the facts. And that's when you have a lot more space for your arguments. So you can give a good reason, the complexity of the issues, the number of issues, but really, really try your best to 
keep it within the eight pages because it's discretionary. And we don't want a good appeal being denied only because it went over to like eight and a half or 10 pages. All right, so those are the only two questions I have. If you can think of anything else after we log off, please send me an email and I'll get an answer to you. Um, just a reminder, our monthly schedule has changed. Um, the first the first Monday of the month, construction webinar series hosted by me. Second Monday, risk transfer, Chris Major. And then we have the New York and the New Jersey in the third and fourth Mondays of the month. Uh, next discussion, uh, general New York topic is going to be in Monday, March 16, and we're going to talk about fraud update. We all want to know how to catch those claimants being fraudulent, so tune in next month. And don't forget, uh, March 2nd, um, the construction webinar, Monday, March 2nd, the construction webinar, tune in and you'll see me live. I'll be talking about uh, pertinent issues in uh, New York workers' compensation claims that arise out of construction accidents. All right, everyone, thank you for tuning in. See you soon.